Hello and good evening to all. Indian College of Anesthesiologists welcome you all to our third year of webinar series. This year, which is our third year in succession, we're going to have some changes introduced in the mode of presentation of our webinars. We'll be adding certain things as extra to what all we discussed. We'll be having case discussion. I mean, case discussion as in an international examination format. We'll be putting up one or two, one or two maximum a month combined with it, some physics, graphics, statics, international problems or importance to anesthesiologists, and something which is unheard in anesthesia education, like the point of care need and the need for advanced studies, all these usually brought in this particular current year. And I am sure our faculty will support you with all sorts of knowledge, what you want for this particular matters. And if anybody has anything to be clarified, you can ask back to the ICA Academy's coordinator, Dr. Sanesh, or to ICA, or to our website, what clarification you may need, or what sort of change you may like. And today's case discussion is a Malgansi and that to carcinoma is a virus. And how we are going to tackle carcinoma is a virus in the theater, as well as for optimization of the particular patient. And then how are you going to look after the patient in the post operative phase? That means all about carcinoma is a virus, what an association should know and should practice, going to be discussed today. And the speakers are one of the postcard students with the Cancer Institute of Holiday Institute of Medical Sciences. We'll be doing a case read-up. Based on the case read-up, discussion will be handed by Dr. Rageshkar Kar and Dr. Dayashri Soor. Well, I don't know to tell about Dr. Ragesh. He's a professor at the Cancer Division of the Old Institute of Medical Sciences and Dr. Professor Jay Shrisu is a director and professor at Sir Gangaram Hospital, another major hospital of the country where cancer patients are coming and getting to their heart's content for a satisfactory treatment. And I request Dr. Rageshkar Kaur and Dr. Jay Shri to open up and go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Radha Krishna, for the introduction. And Rakesh, let's start the case discussion. Sure, ma'am. So uh, I think we'll take it more interactive. And uh, uh, maybe uh, may I welcome uh, Dr. Patishtha Yadav, who is uh, uh, DM Onko Anesthesiology, final year student uh, trainee, and one of the bright students with us. And uh, she will be with me for uh, next around the hours. And uh, Dr. Soon, ma'am, will uh, guide us for. Uh, various aspects of the case discussion of uh, a patient with CA esophagus. So before I take you for the case, uh, let's have some um, uh, basic understanding for the patient with CA esophagus. So when we talk about the esophagus, I think uh, for the postgraduates and the uh, fellow student, it becomes important to understand the clinical anatomy of a particular organ, because once we understand it, we are going to uh, do various uh, steps in a case management that starts from the assessment, that starts from the understanding the surgical steps, based on which we at times try to something called prehabilitate or optimize these patients. And also we need to understand the surgical technique because uh, there will be a lot of uh, things happening during the surgical procedure, which as an anesthesiologist, we need to understand whether they are pathological, 
or whether they are mechanical because of the surgical surgeon's handling. And hence, it becomes to, uh, essential to understand this clinical anatomy. The esophagus is a thin walled hollow tube, 25 centimeter in length. It extends from vertebra C7 to T10. And if you see the structure of the top that is beginning is at cricopharyngeus, at, which is at the level of cricoid cartilage. And it ends up to the stomach at gastroesophageal junction. It's not exactly a hollow tube, which remains a hollow pipe-like structure always. It's a collapsible structure and it has four constrictions, which is at the level of cricopharynx, at the level of aortic arch, at the level of uh, left bronchus when it crosses over, and when it pierces the diaphragm. So these are the constrictions because uh, we need to analyze when we need to look for the barium swallow and other uh, uh, imaging that we are looking for. We need to understand that these are not the strictures or constrictions. These are the anatomical constrictions that are accepted as normal. We also need to understand the lymph node stations because when we talk about the cancer surgeries, there will be lymph nodal restrictions that will be happening. This is one. And second, we also need to understand the involvement of a particular lymph node. This will help in TNM staging for these type of cancers, whether they are resectable or non-resectable, or whether they require preoperative some type of new adjuvant therapies will depend upon understanding of the lymphatic drainage of these tumors. And hence, these uh, uh, various uh, lymph nodes starting from the internal jugular lymph nodes, paratracheal nodes, subcarinal nodes, paraesophageal, paracardiac, all those needs to be understood because when the surgeons plan, they will say that they will do this lymph node dissection. Also, when these being patients are being assessed for surgical resectability or after a new adjuvant chemoradiotherapy, when they are being reassessed for surgical resection, these lymph node stations will also be looked for uh, during the consideration. And since most of these uh, cancer studies are done in conjunction with uh, the anesthesiologist along with the surgical oncologist, and hence we should be well-versed for the lymphatic drainage of these type of tumors. So primarily, we can divide them at supracavicular nodes, superior and media, uh, posterior mediastinal lymph nodes, and celiac nodes. Now, we see the epidemiology because uh, for the postgraduate, sometimes this itself comes as a long question. And hence, some type of epidemiology needs to be understood. It's eighth most common cancer worldwide, sixth most common cause of cancer-related morbidity and mortality. And almost half of these cases will be too advanced. I'm talking about the Indian continent when any treatment is initial not present, uh, is, is uh, not feasible for these patients, upfront surgery is not possible for these patients. And there is a uh, uh, belt uh, along the Assam, Meghalaya, Mizoram, and Nagaland, Kashmir, where uh, these type of tumors are more common. And hence, uh, any patients who are coming from these areas with telltale signs, clinical signs, or symptomatology of, uh, of the CS effects, which I'll be coming a little later, uh, they should be assessed for uh, the occurrence of esophageal cancer. Now, when we talk about the uh, histopathologically, uh, globally, the squamous cell carcinoma, that is esophageal squamous cell carcinoma, is the most prevalent. In developing countries, uh, squamous cell carcinoma is prominent. In developed countries, the adenocarcinoma is most common. And if we see the site of its occurrence, because this will help us to understand the clinical features, Adenocarcinoma is most common in the lower third of the esophagus, while this, uh, the squamous cell carcinoma occurs in the middle third or the upper part of the esophagus more commonly. And as you see that uh, when we talk about the upper part of the uh, esophagus, they are not amenable to upfront surgical procedures. So they are usually posted for uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, while on the middle and the lower half of the uh, carcinoma in the esophagus are usually resectable depending upon their extent, whether they will receive pre new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy or upfront surgery, but upper third will not be amenable to surgical procedures because of the various vital organs sitting out there. It's more commoner in men. The adenocarcinoma is four to five times as high among Caucasians. The adenocarcinoma is 16 times more in obese patients, especially when BMI is more than 30 kg per meter square. It's more common who in take pickled vegetables, ingestion of very hot foods and beverages. That's why we see in more in Kashmir areas. Those patients who have increased uh, abdominal pressures because it facilitates gastroesophageal reflux, 
leading to esophagitis, leading to Barrett's esophagus, and this one remains the precursor for uh, CA esophagus. Also, sometimes the hormonal imbalances do occur, which leads to more amount of gastroesophageal reflux, leading to these type of uh, issues. It's more common associated with uh, smoking and alcohol, more commonly with squamous cell carcinoma. The presence of ecclesia and uh, the strictures that happens because of the ingestion of caustic solutions is also a precursor. And in addition, uh, the presence of HPV-16 uh, is associated with squamous cell carcinoma. The intake of uh, NSAIDs and H. pylori probably have some uh, protective effect, but it's not conclusive. And when we see these features in a patient and we look for features like dysphagia, weight loss, pain, anorexia, vomiting, cachexia, malnutrition, dehydration, anemia, these patients are prone for because they have a gastroesophageal reflux, they have an obstruction, and that's why the chances of aspiration pneumonia are more common. And as I mentioned that half of these patients will come in a locally advanced disease. It also needs to look for the metastasis and local invasion of the nearby structures because sometimes we see that they're invading the pleura or the pericardium or the other structures, and hence they will not be able to manage up front. Now, this is the overall summary. Uh, probably the surgical colleagues will be doing it, but we should be a little uh, you know, aware of that how these patients are being evaluated to reach for a diagnosis based on complete history and examination. Uh, imaging is being done. Usually a PET CT for metastatic workup is being done. They are looked for the metabolic and hepatic panels, which includes the various investigations of blood. And then they go uh, biopsies, which is usually endoscopic biopsies. And sometimes for looking for the nodal stations, they can have endoscopic ultrasound or maybe CT get biopsies sometimes, or usually the bronchoscopic lesions, uh, biopsy is taken, and then uh, approach for management of these patients are taken out. The treatment is primarily combination of chemo radiotherapy followed by surgery, or upfront surgery depends upon the extent of tumor that I've just mentioned to you. And if you see the various factors that will affect the outcome of these patients would be multifactorial. As I mentioned earlier also, that the esophageal carcinomas can be at the lower third or the middle third or the upper third, the extent of disease involvement because it will ensure that whether after and surgical resection can be done or not, the presence of comorbid conditions and patient pressure sometimes will influence the management. And this is an interesting article. I will suggest uh, each one of the residents who are listening to us. This goes to this and this will give a fair idea that what are the management strategies for these patients because as an anesthesiologist, we have an implication for various preoperative therapies that these patients undergo. And not only preoperative therapies, sometimes these patients would receive some of the follow-up uh, therapies after the surgery has been done. And hence, it becomes important to understand those things also. And depending upon, I was just mentioning about the extent of tumor, depending upon this, whether they can go upfront surgical procedure, that is the resection, or they will require some amount of new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy prior to the surgical procedure and then reassessment following the resection procedures. Or in case sometimes if they are too advanced, probably a uh, palliative therapy would be required for these patients. And usually these patients, when they are posted for surgical procedures, the indications would be middle or lower third of esophageal disease I mentioned earlier. The upper third of uh, cancers in the esophagus are not amenable to surgical procedure. They are usually kept for definitive chemo, uh, chemo radiotherapy, or in case if they have an extensive disease with uh, involvement of various lymph nodal stations, which are based on the uh, endoscopic ultrasound evaluation, these patients may be even for palliative therapies or sometimes even stenting. The tumor size is less than five centimeter, but this has become a little variable now because of the advanced procedures and Sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, if they have preoperative neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy, we can assess the tumor size. And sometimes uh, the palliative surgery is being also done if they have some obstruction, the features are because of obstruction. But nowadays, more of an endoscopic procedures are being done. Uh, the upfront uh, palliative surgeries is not much indicated nowadays. The five-year overall survival for surgery alone is 20-25%, and hence uh, they usually require some type of other therapies, which are usually chemotherapy and radiotherapy procedures. 
Now, when these patients are posted for surgical procedures, we need to understand the various surgical techniques because perioperative management of these patients would differ in these type of uh, in these type of surgical procedures. Either they will be for, uh, posted for something called as Ivor Lewis procedures, in which uh, these patients will be uh, having approach from two sites, which will be the abdominal and the right thoracic uh, thoracotomy will be done for these patients to have an access for the esophagus, and then the anastomosis is done in the mediastinum. The other approach would be uh, the McEwen approach, or which is three-field approach, in which uh, the tumor will be accessed and the anastomosis will be done using three approaches. One is the right thoracotomy, the laparotomy from the abdominal approach, and the anastomosis will be done in the cervical area. This is called as McEwen uh, approach for patients with CA esophagus. And the third approach, uh, which is trans which is uh, uh, which was first done by Dr. Oringer, also called as Oringer approach, in which uh, they use the uh, trans approach to dissect the esophagus in the thoracic area and from the abdominal uh, laparotomy being done. And then they do a resection at the cervical area. So a thoracotomy is not required for these patients. And this is how they do uh, the, the esophagus is removed from these areas and then they do an astomosis. We need to remember here, with it's although the surgeon's domain, that uh, now this, uh, the supply of the deconstructed esophagus that goes from the abdominal organ is uh, not from the uh, uh, bronchial or esophageal branches of the aortic area. It is rather being supplied from uh, various uh, arterial supply of the abdomen, primarily from the celiac axis. And hence, uh, it sometimes become essential that the perfusion of these areas should be done, uh, should be kept appropriate, otherwise, the ischemia and dehiscence can happen. And uh, this is one of the catastrophic complications in case if the esophageal dehiscence happens in the mediastinum leading to mediastinitis, which has a high morbidity and mortality. In transhiatal esophagectomy, as I just mentioned, no thoracotomy, it's a blunt dissection of thoracic esophagus through the mediastinum approach. And uh, anastomosis is done in the cervical area. So there is no risk of mediastinal dehiscence leading to mediastinitis, as I just mentioned. But then uh, there will be a lot of uh, hemodynamic perturbations and neural injuries that can happen because uh, the dissection done through the mediastinum in the mediastinum is through the transhiatal approach and hence the injuries can happen to these patients. And also uh, in cancer patients, uh, we are looking for the various lymph nodal stations and the clearance is required. So the clearance may not be very feasible because of the inappropriate visibility when this approach is followed. On the other hand, Ivor Lewis procedure has a good exposure of mid to upper esophageal lesions. And that's why these are usually done for uh, these type of uh, uh, cancer patients who are having lesions at somewhere in the middle esophagus. Now, as I mentioned that many of these patients will require uh, new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy because it has many benefits. It helps the surgeons to have a complete R0 resection. And when we say R0 resection, probably uh, whatever the small tumor seedlings are present around maybe in the form of a local um, uh, advanced disease, they will, be they will be recessed because of this chemoradiotherapy and hence the, uh, the tumor control and survival will be much better if they receive uh, preoperative chemoradiotherapy followed by surgery at interval of four weeks. It was previously suggested that previous uh, preoperative chemoradiotherapy may also increase uh, post-operative mortality rates. But uh, in, in the experienced hand, in the expert centers where they have higher output uh, for operating on these procedures, these complication rates are very minimal with respect to the additional benefits that we get out of it. And there are numerous papers which have come up, numerous trials which have come up, which has confirmed the beneficial effect of neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy followed by surgical resection of these CA esophagus with increased amount, uh, increased survival, overall survival in these patients and achieving the R0 resection for these patients. The various chemotherapy regimes are being used depends upon the histopathology. If it is squamous cell carcinoma, it is usually carboplatin and paclitaxel. If it is adenocarcinoma, it is platinum and a fluoropyrimidine-based uh, chemotherapy is given to these patients. And in both the situations, the concurrent radiotherapy is being given. Usually they are fractionated. They are given five days a week, usually for around a month or so. And a total dose is calculated, which is delivered to them. Uh, it is around 41.4 grays, uh, which is uh, delivered to these patients and fractionated as a just mentioned. Now, usually when these patients receive chemoradiotherapy, 
there will be some physiological changes that happens because of the side effect of chemotherapy as well as the radiotherapy. Most of the time, these are uh, spontaneously uh, healed up, they say they test up. We need to look for the various side effects that these patients have. And usually it takes around uh, four to six weeks for the complete regressal of the various side effects and residual symptoms of the chemotherapy and radiotherapy on the normal cells. And hence, the recommendation by RAS is uh, there should be an optimum time for surgery following neoadjuvant chemotherapy is three to six weeks. We should not be waiting more than six weeks because whatever the tumor has regressed because of the effect of uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy may proliferate further and uh, the achievement of R0 resection may not be possible because the effect of chemo and radiotherapy will get weird off. The optimum time for surgery following new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy is six to 10 weeks following the last year of radiotherapy because there will be cumulative side effect of both the aspects and hence we need to wait a little longer for the regression of various side effects of chemo radiotherapy. So having said this uh, basic overview of the patients of CA esophagus and uh, how the surgeons assess these patients, what these treatments are started on and they are posted for uh, the surgical resection, whether they have received neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy or whether they are kept for upfront, depending upon the staging that they have done based on um, the uh, imaging and based on the nodal biopsies. Now let's go to this uh, for you now. Uh, let's see this case. Over to you. Uh, good evening, respected teachers and all my dear colleagues. Uh, we will proceed with the case scenario. Uh, the case is of uh, Mr. X, a 40-year-old male uh, with ECOG PS score of 2, and he is a known case of CA esophagus with a history of smoking 10 cigarettes per day, uh, with a history of alcohol intake, uh, known case of a diabetes mellitus on uh, OHAs, that is glimepride and metformin, uh, known case of hypertension, taking losartan and etanolol, and he is a post-NACD plan for transthoracic esophagectomy, and he has come to the PSC uh, to the PSA room uh, for the evaluation, pre-op an analysis of this patient. So, right, Patista, this, so this patient, uh, you are the uh, concerned anesthesiologist posted for this surgical procedure, and uh, you are supposed to do the PSA with this background history that is uh, recorded in the file. Mm -hmm. So, at this point of time, let's start. Uh, uh, do you think uh, there is any concerns in these patients? You Can you just give me an overview that if this patient is posted for esophagectomy, as you rightly mentioned, transthoracic esophagectomy? What will be your overview of the concerns that you will look for during your assessment? Uh, if the esophagus is a major, uh, esophagectomy is a major surgery, uh, I would like to divide the major concerns related to the esophagectomy into three parts. First is patient-related concerns, second, uh, second will be disease-related concerns, and third will be the uh, procedure-related concerns. As we look here, the, uh, the some of the concerns, patient-related concerns, here we see the patient is a 40-year-old male with an ECOG score of PS2. And if you look at the uh, the morbidities or the uh, uh, the the patient ha has been smoking for ten cigarettes per day and has an alcohol intake, if we consider the mo uh, comorbidities, the patient is a known case of diabetes and hypertension. So uh, for this, uh, the diabetes and hypertension are uh, one of the uh, key factors that are associated with cardiac uh, uh, cardiac complications. Plus, the patient is also a smoker, a smoker and an alco uh, alcoholic. So we uh, we are also concerned about the various changes that uh, happen due to these two addictions, like uh, change in the immunological uh, system, the uh, the body hemostasis, the immune system is affected uh, due to smoking. There's uh, uh, we are concerned about the po uh, post operative pulmonary complications. Plus the, these two uh, smoking and alcohol are also associated with increased complication in the post operative period, and uh, that are also. Uh, associated with prolonged hospital stay and increased rate of complications. Plus, uh, with the treatment related and the disease related, the patient is a uh, patient has, is a esophageal cancer. So we will be concerned about the risk of aspiration uh, in these patients. And second, uh, he has received, a, he's a post-NACT. So we will be concerned about the complications and the concerns associated with the chemotherapy and the radi uh, radiation therapy. So uh, there are multiple concerns in this patient that we need to evaluate right. in the PSC room. So uh, Desha, you have very nicely summarized that uh, when we want to assess a patient for uh, management for a perioperative care, we will be looking for various situations which are patient-related factors. And you rightly mentioned it could include the demographic profile also of the patient. 
We need to look for any comorbidity. We also need to look for whether patients have received any uh, preoperative therapies and its impact on the patient uh, management. You just mentioned that, uh, you mentioned that it's a 40-year-old male. If I just put it that this patient is an 80-year-old male, do you think uh, your concerns will change in these patients? Is, do age has any concern uh, in management of uh, esophageal carcinoma or surgical resection? Uh, so elderly, 80-year-old uh, will be an elderly male patient. So there are a number of concerns associated with the elderly age group. Uh, it is often associated with number of uh, comorbidities, as mentioned, diabetes, hypertension. Then we'll be concerned about the general well-being, uh, general build of the patient. Uh, what is the nutrition intake? What is the uh, uh, what what is the health and physical status of the patient? And one of the key concern often seen with the elderly patient is the frailty. Frailty is the uh, Inability so we'll, of come, the... we'll come a little later about the frailty. So you rightly mentioned when we talk about the A's, uh, though nowadays because the NSCR practice is quite safe, so we do not say that age is a contraindication, but you rightly said that with the advanced A's, the comorbidities will increase further on. And hence, uh, we need to look for the physical status of the patient or in the other sense, the ECOG score for this patient to look for whether the patient will be able to tolerate a major surgical intervention whether the patient has responded well as this patient was having a new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy prior to the surgical procedure. So probably the recovery of, of uh, these patients may be a little delayed and hence the assessment becomes important. But rightly mentioned that uh, whether whatever the age of these patients is, they do not influence much with regards to the uh, even the oncologic outcome. But yes, we need to look for the decrease in the physiological reserve of these patients as you rightly mentioned, that can happen with the increasing age. So you were talking about the frailty. So uh, we'll continue with the frailty, Pratishta. Do you think, uh, what exactly this frailty is? And do you think a uh, patient of an 80 year old male will have different frailty index or maybe some other score that you can think of for the frailty assessment? And does it affect actually our perioperative outcome in such major surgical procedures? Uh, sir, uh, the frailty, uh... For, uh, for assessment of the frailty, there are two indexes are is uh, available. Uh, as rightly mentioned, the, it's a state of extreme vulnerability to physiological stressors that leads to adverse health outcomes. So to define frailty, there are two uh, uh, two uh, uh, two uh, uh, two types of uh, we have indexes. First is uh, five point index and eleven point index. So uh, uh, as uh, uh, the different studies have shown that as the score increases, that the frailty index increases, uh, there is increase uh, two times increase uh, uh, risk of complication in the patient as compared to the lower frailty index. So if you look at the uh, what are the different components of the frailty index, here we see in the 11 point frailty index, uh, it uh, includes what is the general uh, functional health status before the surgery of the patient, then diabetes, uh, then the history of COPD, that is, uh, uh, or current pneumonia. Then if the patient has a history of congestive heart failure within 30 days before surgery, if there is a history of myocardial infarction within six months before the surgery, if there is a patient has a history of previous percutaneous coronary intervention or previous cardiac surgery or history of angina one month prior to the surgery, uh, if the patient, uh, as in our patient, hypertension requiring medication, if uh, the patient has already has impaired sensorium, if there is a his, uh, so the uh, history of transient ischemic attack, cerebral vascular accident, strokes, or history of revascularization or amputation. So these are the eleven points of the modified frailty index, and we have another five point frailty index to uh, to uh, simplify the uh, the complications. So it includes only five factors: that is diabetes, hypertension, CHF, uh, COPD, and functional status. And our patient has to uh, already has diabetes and hypertension. Uh, once we calculate the frailty index, it was seen that the, uh, uh, the frailty index of, uh, there is not much difference in the results of frailty index 5 and 11. And uh, even if we are using the frailty index of 5, uh, modified frailty index 5, then uh, we are able to, uh, 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 to predict the complications, post-operative complications in these patients. Right, so I think uh, uh, you have raised an important point, uh, Patisla, here that uh, frailty is upcoming as one of the marker for change in the perioperative outcome. And this has emerged as one of the uh, assessment parameter that we need to look for because it's more of a physiological uh, change or physiological stress stressors 
that will change in the physiological condition of a particular patient. And hence, uh, there are various factors that will be affected because of this change in the uh, physiology of the patient or physiological reserve of the patient. And hence, you rightly mentioned, uh, there are a number of studies which mention that the mortality rate increased from 1.8, almost 10 to 15 times in case if the Fredri index increased from zero to five. And hence, uh, the assessment of these uh, uh, tools, which you rightly mentioned about the 11 point modified frailty index, which you have nicely summarized. And you also talk, talk about the five factor score for uh, short uh, modified frailty index by American College of Surgeons and SQIP data. These are important parameters that we should not be missing because uh, the morbidity and mortality is increasing almost from 10 to 15 times. And many of these factors uh, can be prehabilitated or optimized to a certain extent in these patients in the preoperative period. So the surgical patients are called as time-sensitive surgeries. This means we do not have much prolonged time to optimize these patients. But yes, we do have some time, maybe four to six weeks for these patients while these are being assessed. And hence, we should use this window period to try to decrease the various risk factors that probably would affect the post-operative outcome of these patients. And hence, threat index should be a part of, uh, as Pratish mentioned, should be a part of our assessment in the pre-operative period. Uh, Pratish, coming to the same patient uh, uh, which you have described, uh, do you think uh, if, when, if this patient is posted for uh, the surgical procedure, uh, would there be, you talk about the demographic profile, you talk about uh, the fertility index where you have talked about various uh, indices and factors. Do you think there will be any cardiac consideration for these patients also? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, if you look to the, the two morbidities like diabetes and hypertension, the patient is already having and we know they are quite associated with the uh, cardiac complication. Plus, uh, we see that the patient has received uh, chemotherapy. There are some of the chemotherapeutic drugs that are commonly used in uh, esophageal, so esophageal is cancer. Protein, uh, dividing into two aspects. One, the patient associated comorbidity, yes, which could be probably a pre-existing hypertension and diabetic induced change in the cardiac function. This is one aspect. And second, you said that the treatment related. So this patient has undergone probably new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy. So both the chemotherapy and radiation exposure to the chest, because this is serious esophagus, probably will have some impact on the cardiac function that you are looking for. So what else you are looking for from the cardiac point of view? Uh, Say so some of the chemotherapeutic, uh, chemotherapeutic, uh, chemotherapeutic agents like uh, uh, carboplatin and paclitaxel, these are often associated with the uh, 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 increased QT interval and they have shown to have increased, uh, anest uh, increased uh, cardiac depression effects with the anesthetic drugs. Uh, and uh, if and further... Uh, so you rightly said, yes, you rightly said there will be change in the cardiac function. There could be cardiac toxicity. There could be uh, electrical conduction defects that can happen to these patients. Uh, these patients could have, uh, uh, because of the uh, radiation exposure, they could have fibrosis. They could have various arrhythmias and that needs to be assessed. Mm -hmm. And we remember that uh, uh, because these remains are concerned because those patients who undergo esophagectomy, whatever the approach is, whether it is uh, through transhiatal esophagectomy, uh, the chances of arrhythmias are much higher. Almost one in third patient, one in three patients will get uh, these type of arrhythmias. And the commonest arrhythmias is the atrial fibrillation. And hence, it becomes very, very essential to assess these patients preoperatively from the cardiac point of view because these arrhythmias postoperatively can lead to decompensation of the cardiac functions. And hence, these patients may have increased mobility and mortality leading to increased length of hospital stay, increased of postoperative death. And hence, it is very, very essential to identify the at-risk patients, uh, which are usually patients who are male, more than 65 years, with a history of pulmonary disease, smoking, COPDs, history of cardiac disease like CADs or hypertension, controlled or maybe uncontrolled, and those who have received the new adjuvant chemotherapy. So these patients are more prone for these type of uh, cardiac dysfunction, arrhythmias, even the uh, occurrence of post-operative MIs are also seen in these patients, though the uh, occurrence of arrhythmia is to the tune of 20%, but the MI is just 1-2% to because we are using safer drugs. Analgia technique is much better. Surgical 
so the patient's physiological stress is much less and uh, and the chances of uh, these type of uh, major adverse cardiac events have reduced to a large extent and that's why we need to have an important history that needs to be elicited when these patients are posted for surgical procedure which includes the history of cad prior mi angina diabetes hypertension and not only this history but the extent of the optimization of this history and whether the patient is with good compliance of medications so that these the disease are optimized they are not decompensated needs to look for and for this you need to have an assessment of uh, 12 edcg you need to have a static echocardiography or at times you require an exercise based test which could be a stress echo or nowadays we are more commonly using a cardio pulmonary exercise exercise test which gives a very comprehensive global assessment of cardio respiratory functions at times those patients who are manifesting signs of angina or similar cardiac symptoms they may also require coronary angiography so rightly you mentioned that these all things are required and at times uh, these patients if they are having symptomatic cardiac uh, disease they may also be started on beta blockers which was earlier uh, a strategy but uh, there is nothing specific for ca esophagus and looking for the outcome and hence the evidence level is moderate but recommendation remains strong for these patients but remember that acute strategy of beta blockers may not offer a large protective effect from mi in the perioperative period so it may not be indicated those who are not but those who are already on beta blockers should be continued in the perioperative period now this was an another strategy because as i mentioned the chances of arrhythmias is also between of 10 to 20% so whether a role of prophylactic amiodarone is indicated for these patients probably this may reduce the incidence of uh, post operative uh, atrial fibrillation but uh, routine use is not suggested for all the esophagectomy patients because this drug itself has its own side effect it may lead to hemodynamic disturbances and hence the prophylactic use of amiodarone is not required in the post operative period if the patient becomes hemodynamically unstable with atrial fibrillation probably uh, along with the other uh, electrical therapy the patients may also require amiodarone continuation for the control of uh, the atrial fibrillation and this uh, uh, the study which also mentioned that the prophylactic iv amiodarone probably reduces the incidence of uh, af but is associated with various uh, cardiovascular events which includes hypotension bradycardia and qt interval prolongation and hence prophylactic role of preoperative amiodarone to control the af is not suggested so prince you mentioned about uh, to start with about the overview then you mentioned about the cardiac considerations and uh, what we need to look for uh this patient has a pft report that is in front of you with the fvc 80% fv1 70% predicted he has poor oral hygiene because these patients usually have uh, uh, refluxes after radiation therapy the sometimes the oral hygiene becomes poor in these patients so do you think this patient would have some pulmonary concentration also some respiratory things which could affect the perioperative outcome you need to assess preoperatively and try to optimize them Uh, yes sir uh, the patient has multiple i can see multiple factors that can lead to increase uh, pulmonary complication as we know that the cs uh, during the esophagectomy we are uh, dealing with uh, we, we will require one lung ventilation as there will be already be uh, handling of the lungs so uh, and there will be uh, edema uh, and there is always a risk of acute lung injury in these patients apart from that the patient as we see is a smoker and uh, we know the smoker uh, sm uh, smoking uh, has uh, due to the smoke there is a uh, cigarette smoking there is an exposure to carbon monoxide and uh, nicotine as we know the nicotine uh, leads to the increase uh, uh, increase sympathetic stimulation and increase oxygen requirement plus carbon monoxide has its own uh, negative effects on the oxygenation in the body apart from that smoking also affects the mucus increases the mucus production and causes the uh, uh, injury to the uh, the airway uh, airway and the uh, mu uh, movement of the uh, of the uh, the uh, the, uh, the airway uh, in the in the respiratory tract plus uh, the pfts are deranged and also there is a poor oral hygiene in these patient these are the, uh, these are the, some of the predictors of uh, uh, increased risk of post op pulmonary complication in these patients from the optimization point of view we will suggest the patient to stop the smoking uh, as soon as possible and uh, if we look at the uh, as we know uh, uh, even as it's a time bound surgery 
uh, ideally it should be uh, four weeks but uh, even uh, stopping the cigarette smoking for 24 to 48 hours has its beneficial effects as it decreases the carbon monoxide uh, content in the body uh, plus for the pfts uh, deranged pfts we can uh, we can ask the patient uh, for uh, prehabilitation like we can ask the patient to have uh, deep breathing exercise do incentive spirometry and uh, another uh, way of optimization is also uh, by, and you can also ask the patient to have a good oral hygiene in these patients. Right, I think uh, very well summarized because uh, we know that the involvement of uh, pulmonary functions are an important aspect because you rightly mentioned patient is a smoker. And uh, we also discussed earlier that patients of CO-sophagus could have gastroesophageal reflux disease. They could have some amount of uh, you know, silent aspirations leading to some amount of uh, the lung involvement because of this gastroesophageal reflux disease. And simultaneously, if they have received uh, liver driven chemo radiotherapy, probably the lung involvement because of the radiation exposure could also be there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, probably we require, we will uh, come a little later, that uh, during the airway management, uh, especially when uh, the therapotomy is required for uh, assessing or dissection of the uh, esophageal aspect, they will require one lung ventilation, especially when they are even posted for uh, beds. And hence, uh, given the current ventilation, uh, we need to look for the optimization of this uh, respiratory status. So just to summarize what uh, Pratishtha has mentioned, that uh, the pulmonary complications are the commonest. One in three patients will have some amount of uh, pulmonary complication in the form of hypoxemia, uh, requiring high airway pressures, uh, fall in the saturation sometime, the tachypnea, and all those complications happen. Even the retention of carbon dioxide is seen in these patients. So these are the most frequent complications uh, followed by the cardiac complication, which we mentioned earlier about the atrial fibrillation. And this becomes uh, more of an issue because uh, the record will be required. And even in, in the trans hiatal, a lot of lung handling will be there. And hence, uh, the pulmonary testing should be done for these patients. And they need to be optimized, as Pratishtha rightly mentioned, that even a day of uh, stoppage of uh, smoking is beneficial because when the patient is asked for stoppage of smoking, there will be some benefits which take some time to recover, like ciliary functions, which will take weeks to recover. But there will be some in a day, like, for example, the level of carbon monoxide, which are inherent part of the smoking aspects. Also, in our patient, uh, the patient has a decrease in the FVC and FV1. So probably this patient would have increased chance of complications. And hence, whatever time we have, we need to look for the prehabilitation or optimization of the pulmonary functions as well in the preoperative period. Pratishta, back to you. Uh, I know that you are doing a lot of CPAT. Uh, this is a newer modality which is being done for uh, patients uh, who are having cancer and posted for major surgical procedures. You already mentioned that these patients who have cardiac dysfunction, pulmonary dysfunction, you talked about frailty, you also talk about uh, the presence of pre-existing comorbidity. So do you think uh, uh, there is any role of CPAT in this risk reduction in perioperative management of carcinoma esophagus? Or how will you take uh, the CPAT as one of the modality in the preoperative period for management of your patient? Uh, uh, CPET is a uh, it's a very uh, very uh, comprehensive test that is uh, that helps in evaluating the cardiopulmonary function as a combined modality and we can easily uh, identify the, whether the patient is a compromised cardiac uh, with, from the cardiac point of view or the pulmonary point of view. And the, uh, this patient, uh, the CPET will not only help in identifying the uh, identifying the risk factors, cardiac or pulmonary risk factors, but it can also be used as a uh, as prehabilitation by uh, in the CPET, we are uh, actually the patient is uh, doing a treadmill or a cycling exercise, and we see the what is oxygen consumption and the CO2 production in this patient. So by uh, it's a uh, mode of exercise. It can help if uh, in Iras has suggested that even the CPET can be used for prehabilitation uh, about three times a week. If a CPET is done uh, preoperatively for four to six weeks, it can help in increasing the. Uh, increasing the uh, patient's uh, base, uh, baseline parameters and uh, gives increase the uh, uh, increase the patient's uh, efforts and uh, general physical condition of the patient so rightly mentioned uh, i think uh, you rightly mentioned that cpet has a dual role in a preoperative period one is a diagnostic modality 
So when we are looking for a comprehensive global cardiorespiratory reserve of a patient, probably CPAT gives you various ideas. They have various parameters like VO2 and so many other parameters. That will give a fair idea that how much will be the tolerability of these patients for a major surgical procedure. This is one aspect. And nowadays, uh, even the major surgical procedure, CPAT is being used as a part of prehabilitation that we just mentioned about the training of these patients to increase their physiological reserves. And hence, CPAT has been used just not for training, but we can assess that how much the patient has improved with CPAT training, and it has become an important tool. So the evaluation of cardiopulmonary exercise testing in esophagectomy uh, is not extensive, but there are, there are many literatures which has come up uh, with the beneficial role of uh, the CPAT in these type of surgical procedures. And it has been seen that uh, when these patients receive chemotherapy, their peak oxygen delivery and the anaerobic threshold is decreased. And that usually improves with time. And we have discussed earlier that after the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we give a window period of four to six weeks for these patients for physiological improvement. And this four to six week period, we can use uh, CPAT as a modality for prehabilitation of these patients, just not to monitor them, but to also look for or train the uh, cardiorespiratory function so that uh, they can improve. And that. there are numerous studies which are coming up, which has uh, proven its role for the uh, beneficial role for the CPAT. So coming back to you, uh, Patista, once again. So what do you think are the main preoperative interventions uh, that will prevent postoperative pneumonia? Because you mentioned earlier that there will be lung handling, there will be reconstruction of the esophagus. The sphincteric action may not be so strong. There could be silent regurgitations and aspiration in addition to the handling of the lungs during the uh, resection of the esophagus. So what are the, I mean, uh, what all will you do to so that uh, the lung functions are preserved and these patients have decreased pulmonary morbidity in the post-operative period? So we'll encourage the patient uh, to stop the, uh, to, to, to stop smoking as soon as possible. And uh, we can also, if uh, there's some amount of addiction, we can also take the help of, uh, uh, to, uh, with the help of nicotine patches to get, uh, to avoid the nicotine uh, uh, to symptoms. And uh, secondly, as mentioned previously, we can, uh, we will encourage the patient to do deep breathing exercises, to do incentive spirometry. We'll train the patient preoperatively uh, with the, how to use properly incentive spirometry so that the patient can also uh, continue that in the post-operative period. That is also important once the patient has uh, undergone one lung ventilation. And uh, apart from that, uh, diaphragmatic exercises can be uh, encouraged. Steam inhalation can be encouraged in these patients in the preoperative period. You rightly mentioned that the pulmonary rehab, uh, prehabilitation has to be done in these patients. You already mentioned about uh, the smoking situation and we have discussed about its beneficial effect. So whatever time we have, four to six weeks, we should look for. You also rightly mentioned about the respiratory training, uh, which could be in the form of incentive spirometry that we are uh, recruiting the silent alveoli and uh, they opened up nicely. In addition to it, uh, we have to train the muscles this could be the inspiratory muscles, including the diaphragm. And we also have to make them effective cuff so that the, uh, the secretions which are there in the post-operative period, uh, they, they have the effective cuff uh, that is being trained for. And this has become a, a major uh, prehabilitation part for these type of surgical procedures because the uh, stagnant uh, secretions in the lung are uh, potent nidus for infection in the post-operative period especially on the background of lung handling during the esophageal dissections. And hence, it becomes important to look for these type of exercise and training also. And you also rightly mentioned that oral hygiene, the oral uh, infections are one of the uh, common nidus for various uh, pleuras, which can lead to occurrence of lung infections. And hence, these patients should also be guided and instructed to take care of their oral hygiene uh, uh, in the preoperative period. So the next question is, uh, we talk about the smoking aspect and uh, you mentioned in your history that the patient was also alcoholic. So you, you mentioned about uh, the smoking situation, immediate short-term effect, long-term beneficial effect. What do you think is the minimal advisable interval between alcohol abstinence and these, uh, when these patients are posted for surgical procedure? Uh, so there's uh, there's no clear cut inter time duration interval for which it has been uh, seen that uh, the minimum intervals for which it should be stopped, but it has been recommended that at least for four weeks the patient should uh, the complete abstinence should be there, 
for alcohol consumption right yeah. so i think it's not uh, uh, very clear that how much is important but yes it's a, we already mentioned in the beginning that is a risk factor for post operative complication because alcohol has effect on various systems and especially when the uh, alcohol consumption is high it can affect the immune capacity it can affect the cardiac function it can reduce the stress response uh, by the endocrine uh, axis that we have for uh, responding to the surgical stress it also affect on the coagulation system it also delays the macrophage uh, uh, no uh, macrophage uh, coming at the incisional site and thus delays the wound healing process and this all will lead to delayed recovery in the post operative period so these are the beneficial effects and when we talk about the particular timing we, we do not know that how much time it will take but yes as we talk about the smoking probably uh, four weeks would be required which seems acceptable for cancer patients also uh, so that the side effect profile the immune system the coagulation system they will try to recover physiologically within this period of time any effect of chemo radiation you said this patient has received nsct and uh, uh, as mentioned uh, he has received paclitaxel and carboplatin with around 50 grays of uh, uh, the radiation exposure into fractionated 25 fractions over 5 weeks he has lost 10% of weight in the last one month and uh, he is posted for surgery so what chemo radiation effect we will look for and uh, um we want to wait for some more time after this has been completed or you want to optimize in some way sir so as we see uh, the patient has received chemo plus radiation therapy some of the common side effects of chemo uh, chemotherapy are uh, nausea vomiting then they can be mucositis uh, diarrhea uh, constant sometimes constipation also this can uh, overall these symptoms can uh, decrease the overall intake and uh, absorption and nutrition absorption in these patients that can be one of the reason why the patient has lost weight uh, and also the radiation therapy is also associated with local changes of the skin as well as of the mucositis and uh, local changes that is very painful for the patient and further decrease as the patient is already having cas of figures with the difficulty in deglutition and everything along with that the patient is having uh, local symptoms that is very painful and can reduce the intake overall intake in these patients plus uh, other complications specific complications as previously mentioned the cardiac uh, complications like uh, the patient can have uh, uh can have increased qt prolongation they can be increased uh, it can affect the uh, overall uh, cardiac output in these patient there can be increased exaggerated uh, cardio depressant actions of the anesthetic drugs uh, uh plus uh, apart from this uh, if you look at the pulmonary complication the some of the chemotherapeutic uh, agents can also be associated with the uh, lung fibrosis also the radiation therapy of the uh, chest area can also affect the uh, can also lead to the lung fibrosis and decrease the uh, and impair the oxygenation in these patients uh, thirdly uh, the patient can have <clears throat> renal toxicity due to the chemotherapeutic agents like especially the uh, platins that uh, uh, that uh, especially uh, that can lead to the that can be renal toxic and should we should be very cautious uh, especially uh, and we should be cautious during the intraoperative period to maintain adequate hydration and to maintain renal perfusion in these patients and avoid the nephrotoxic drugs and uh, some of the paclitaxel is also associated with uh, neurotoxicity so if the patient has uh, some uh, neurotox uh, uh, peripheral neuropathy symptoms uh, like uh, tingling or weakness or anything we should document that pre uh, preoperatively if we are using epidural or any uh, regional anesthesia we should be uh, well aware of what are the symptoms the patient is uh, previously having due to chemotherapy and we should document it and we should be uh, uh, keep that in mind perfect i think nicely summarized that each of the component uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy probably would have some local effect radiation therapy and will have some systemic effect and there will be some specific drugs that will have various uh, effect on the various organ systems of the body so when you are assessing these patients you should look for uh, the various effects that would have on various aspects they could be a combination of various drugs that are uh, given to these patients most commonly we mentioned that is usually carboplatin and paclitaxel based which is usually combined with radiation therapy but at times uh, we also use uh, cisplatin with capacitabine or 5-fluorouracil combinations which are required for these patients and sometimes uh, the other drugs and a refractory case uh, we use docetaxel 
uh, cisplatin and 5 fluoro combination also depending upon the histotopology. And you rightly mentioned that we have to look for uh, the general side effects of the chemotherapy, which are usually diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite. There will be a lot of mucositis uh, along the GI, starting from the oral mucosa uh, to the esophagus to the lower GI that can lead to even diarrhea or at times constipations. So we have to look for this and that's why your patient was almost having a weight loss of 10% and you need to look for all those aspects. In addition, uh, there could be generalized effect also. There could be low blood counts, immunity will be suppressed and that can lead to further bleeding and bruising. And also these patients are more prone to fatigue. The cardiac toxicity you rightly mentioned when we talk about the system organ because uh, uh, these uh, drugs or direct exposure of radiation to the heart will lead to various amount of cardiotoxicity, like cisplatin and anthracycline drugs will have a uh, change in the, uh, leads to the occurrence of arrhythmia, especially the ventricular tachycardias. They can have QT prolongations, and they can also lead to some amount of uh, myocardial and endocardial fibrotic changes. Uh, that's why uh, these patients should be looked for the metabolic equivalence as a screening, and then they should go for assessment using ECG and 2D ECO to look for the effect on these patients. You should also be clear that uh, uh, various chemotherapeutic agents will have global impact on the cardiac functions and the drugs that we use because these patients would require general anesthesia. And since these patients are prone for arrhythmias, the exposure of chemotherapy enhances the uh, cardiotoxicity with myocardial uh, depression defect. And also the chances of arrhythmias are increased though we are using uh, inhalation agents which are less arrhythmogenic, but earlier exposure were much higher. And hence we need to uh, not only assess these patients, but appropriately monitor intraoperatively using uh, various monitoring tools at times, even to the extent of cardiac output monitor that would be required for these patients. Similarly, pulmonary toxicity can also happen in these patients uh, and hence needs to be looked for. And this becomes an important issue because uh, uh, the ciliary functions are affected. They are prone for bleeding. They are prone for mucositis here also, and hence the chances of uh, post-operative pneumonias will be increased in these patients. And hence, when you are assessing these patients, you should look for various effect and impact of these agents on the patients. And though the bleomycin is not so commonly used in these patients, but if yes, we know that it will have an impact on the oxygen diffusion capacity of these patients, and hence you need to assess for these patients also. Uh, we know that the oxygen therapy for patients who have received biomycin, you have to be a little cautious. You need to accept a low saturation. Uh, FI2 needs to be kept as low as possible in these patients because of the effect of biomycin on the pulmonary functions. You also mentioned that these patients, especially those who have received platinum-based drugs, they have renal toxicity. And hence, uh, when they have received, they could have a lot of dehydration, diarrhea, they could have leads to the hypovolemia. This can further precipitate acute kidney injury in these patients. And hence, we should be careful, not only for dehydration, but for causing any additional inserts on the renal functions, like avoiding the use of NSAIDs and maintaining a good hydration for these patients. Be cautious about the hepatic toxicity also, because uh, these patients will have impaired the uh, hepatic metabolism uh, because of the impact of uh, especially the chemotherapy. And many of the anesthetic drugs are metabolized by the hepatic functions and hence their action may be prolonged. And if they are releasing the active metabolite, like for example, say morphine, if you are using, they have an active metabolite, their, their duration of action will be prolonged in these patients. These patients also cause uh, uh, neural uh, dysfunction, especially drugs like cisplatin and vincristin. And hence, we need to assess the neurological function also in the preoperative period. And in case if you are planning to go for the regional blocks, or regional anesthesia, be cautious because they will be more prone for uh, neural injury uh, when these patients are administered the uh, regional blocks or central neurexial blockade. We have already talked about the GI toxicity. It's a most, uh, most chemotherapy drugs will cause nausea, vomiting, they will diarrhea, mucositis. These are the commonest side effect of the majority of uh, chemotherapeutic agents and same will be applicable for drugs which are given for CA esophagus. And hence we need to look for the status of uh, fluid and electrolyte in these patients because both can be altered and this can affect the outcome of these patients. Hence try to, try to optimize these patients as far as possible. The systemic effect in the form of myelosuppression, 
which is caused by a majority of chemotherapy drugs as well as by the radiation therapy. And hence, these patients may not manifest the classical signs of infection. We should be a little more cautious. We should be following all aseptic precautions in these patients. And simultaneously, we also need to be a little careful for the coagulation cascade that can be affected by these agents because of the suppression, myelosuppression. The radiation toxicity, again, can be to various organs. It could be systemic effect, including the skin. It could be the uh, general, uh, local effect as the skin, or it could be a diffuse effect on the multiple organs, um, even the GI system, and hence it needs to be looked for. Also, it causes a lot of mucositis, and hence the intake of these patients be reduced. You should be careful in these patients during the prehabilitation part so that these patients are uh, nutritionally well-fed when they are posted for uh, the surgical procedure. As I mentioned earlier, most of these side effects are temporary. They try to recover within four to six weeks, majority of them. But some of these side effects will lead to in the form of, uh, uh, you can say the fibrosis lesions will happen when these mucositis and all those uh, recover. And they can lead to a good amount of uh, uh, mucosal fibrosis. They can lead to lung damage and they can have residual impact on the pulmonary functions also. These patients also remain at high risk of venous thrombolism, and we know that risk factors for uh, venous thrombolism in cancer patients are many. Malignancy is itself a risk factor. Major surgical procedures with immobility is a risk factor. Use of preoperative treatment in the form of chemotherapy or radiotherapy is itself a risk factor. And hence, uh, these patients have a very high risk factor for venous thrombolism, and hence we need to look for the preventive measures for preventing uh, venous thrombolism in these patients when they are posted for major surgical procedures. And that's why uh, during the surgical procedures, uh, uh, even on the preoperative way, they are started on low molecule weight heparin. We need to have multimodal preventive strategies for preventing of uh, embolism. We can use even the mechanical measures during the surgical procedures and the postoperative period. And we need to continue with the uh, uh, pharmacological uh, prophylaxis by using low molecular weight heparin in the post-operative period also. And accordingly, we can decide our regional blocks. Now, there are certain uh, uh, scoring systems which are available, which we can use for uh, looking for the outcome of these patients. And uh, especially when we are looking for surgical procedures, which are uh, having uh, a high comorbidity associated we can use uh, this type of uh, uh, risk scoring system, which will help us to prognosticate these patients and to provide them appropriate post-operative care. And this study has rightly mentioned that using this type of uh, pre-operative esophagectomy risk score, uh, they can predict the system of patients who are undergoing esophagectomy. So we are talking about the prehabilitation and we have talked multiple aspects. And uh, uh, in the last few slides, we talk about the nutritional aspect also. And you said that these patients will be nutritionally deprived maybe because of the esophageal cancer itself, because they will be leading to obstruction. Uh, they will not be taking. And then you said that uh, the, even the chemo radiotherapy can lead to diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, intake will discuss. So how and uh, at what step uh, will you look for the nutritional advice so that these patients are nutritionally optimized because if we see this patient which you just mentioned the albumin level is 2.8 gram per deciliter so how will you go about it so there are um, i can see multiple points that are indicating towards a nutritional depri deprivation in this patient and need of nutritional requirement in these patients uh, the esophageal cancer has the highest median weight loss and prior to the diagnosis of all the cancers, the extent of weight loss is often associated with the redu reduction in the overall survival in these patients. The malnutrition can affect up to 80% of the patients with significant morbidity. So uh, the first step is the assessment of the nutritional status uh, early in the treatment trajectory with the first point of exposure when we get first exposed to the patient. Then uh, we apply the nutritional interventions accordingly and optimize the nutritional status prior to the surgery in these patients. First is the identification and screening and assessment. As per ESPE, uh, presence of any one of these factors, following factors, is uh, indication towards the need of nutritional support. First is a severe weight loss, that is more, uh, more than 10 to 15 percent in the last six months. Then a low BMI of less than 18.5. Then a use of subjective global assessment uh, grade and the grade C that is extremely uh, nutritionally deprived patient 
and in the albumin level of less than 3 g per dl in absence of hepatic or renal failure a presence of any of these factors is related with uh, need of nutritional supplementation Uh, these criteria define the high risk of malnutrition as well as the disease associated catabolism uh, the nutritional assessment should be undertaken in all the patients with the view of detecting and optimizing the nutritional status before the surgery so right i mean uh, you, because uh, these patients would be at risk of nutritional deficiency and hence uh, assessment is very very important and once we assess using various parameters uh, even the subjective global assessment form is one of the important uh, tool for assessing the overall nutritional status of these patients we just assess various parameters and give you a fair idea that this patient is uh, mild moderate or severely cataclysmic and uh, as we know that uh, albumin also is an independent predictor of the outcome of these patients so based on this we have to uh, identify these patient assess these patients and look for what uh, reason behind is for the malnutrition we have to take some uh, uh, some uh, management strategies based on the uh, patient assessment of uh, these patients and the nutritional intervention should be based on the level of risk because these are posted for major surgical procedures and accordingly we can think of that what route of uh, intervention would be appropriate for these patient and it is strongly recommended uh, that the patients uh, needs to have priority as enteral support for improving the nutritional state of these patients as far as possible and when we talk about the pre operative nutrition therapy the main goal is to prevent or treat early malnutrition so that's why when these patients are being worked up or going undergoing the new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy is the right time because it's a catabolic phase and we know that the the catabolism itself with poor uh, albumin low albumin levels and uh, cataclysmic phase it is self a reason for morbidity and uh, decreased quality of life so we need to have preventive strategies at this point itself and then uh, the pre operative nutrition therapy should be implemented for 7 to 10 days to optimize the mildly malnourished patients but remember uh, these patients should not be posted a day later with the parenteral therapy by starting them on parenteral therapy and post it for the surgical procedure because this will increase for complications in the perioperative period and hence the strategy is always preventing and treating them early rather than just prior to the surgical procedure those patients who are having low physical reserves especially the sarcopenic and frail patients which we have discussed earlier they probably require a multimodal therapy uh in addition to the physical rehabilitation because they will be having sarcopenia and when they have a sarcopenia we were talking about the respiratory reserves we were talking about the muscle training and hence these patients would have increased chance of pneumonias increased chance of infections and hence these patients will require multimodal management to improve the protein status the muscle status the physical exercise and then subsequently they can be posted for surgical procedure usually uh, th these patients are kept for uh, conventionally uh, uh, 25 to 30 kilo calories per kg per day with around 1 to 1.5 grams protein per kg per day but then we have to follow uh, uh, in addition to the other uh, uh, macronutrients which will be required for these patients the decision between enteral versus parenteral i think there is not much confusion it is always accepted that enteral is preferred over parenteral because parenteral nutrition has its own side effects especially uh, the parenteral nutrition is a potent nidus for infections and hence uh, it remains uh, a lot of infectious complications especially when they are being given pre operatively and there could be a many ways of uh, uh, giving this nutrition we can go ahead and do a gastrostomy or gynostomy for these patients to improve the nutritional status at times they can go prophylactic stenting so that they can orally and each has its own limitation and hence needs to be individualized as per the patient assessment we can go for each either of these uh, enteral support system so that these patients can be nutritionally supplemented appropriately prior they are posted for major surgical procedures the stent placement uh, are there the endoscopic stent placement are emerging they are safer tools they are non invasive tools they are kept uh, for uh, the obstructed site of the esophagus and that improves the patient's nutritional intake and thus improves the quality of life the role of uh, various uh, immune nutrition is a little controversial they have been in the literature for last so many uh, so many years and decades and their role has uh, always been challenged and it has been hypothesized to have a positive modulatory effect on immune and inflammatory response to surgical status or uh, surgical stress 
and they stimulate protein synthesis and consequently probably they will reduce post operative complication that's why the aspen guidelines recommend the use of immunonutrition in the perioperative period but uh, uh, their definitive role in the outcome is not very well assessed but what we are looking for uh, one of the aspect of prehabilitation would be the nutritional intervention and it has to be a multimodal approach so i think uh, pratishtha was trying to uh, bring many aspects into it when we take the respiratory aspect it was muscle training when we talk about the nutrition aspect we talk about the sarcopenia when we talk about the uh, cardiac status we talk about the frailty so if we just knit everything into a one system this means the nutrition is not one nutrition is does not mean albumin level of 3 nutritional deficit means that patient will not be having an effective cuff nutritional means the patient will not be having good respiratory excursions it means that there will be increased chance of respiratory uh, uh, respiratory complications so that's why rather than acting on an individual aspect what for cancer surgery we are looking is looking for the prehabilitation programs where we look for the multimodal approach because each aspect is related to the other aspect and hence uh, prehabilitation programs are becoming more and more important and it also includes structured and goal directed exercise program because the patients of cancer patients frail patients have poor poor uh, uh, muscle efforts they have less metabolism the catabolic state is much higher and these type of structured and goal directed exercise programs which uh, includes both aerobic and strengthening acti activities improves the outcome of these patients coming back to another another interesting question to pratishtha now uh, what about the fasting guidelines for these patients now esophagectomy obstruction we talk about the esophageal dysmotility in these patients we have fasting guidelines from the other countries we have fasting guidelines from our own society by indian society of anesthesiologists also so what's your take about uh, the fasting uh, uh, fasting period or uh, carbohydrate loading or whatever you want to say about uh, these fasting related issues the fasting guidelines are sir, almost uh, are similar to that of the other patients in these patients uh, uh, the prolonged fasting is not recommended plus the carbohydrate loading is encouraged to avoid the insulin resistance and unnecessary stress perioperative stress in these patients apart from them uh, that to avoid the uh, aspiration risk we can uh, the ng tube aspiration ng tube can be inserted and aspiration uh, decompression of the uh, stomach and the esophagus esophagus can be done preoperatively before induction of the in these patients right i think rightly mentioned that it's not of much of a difference and uh, nowadays the carbohydrate preloading uh, to us prior to surgery is uh, suggested because it has been found to uh, Uh, decrease the stress response and the outcome is increased and that's why we can use it and you rightly mentioned that we should be careful uh, because if a patient is having a gastroesophageal reflux disease or an obstruction uh, and if these patients are on uh, ng tube respiration uh, they can have increased risk of aspiration and hence should be aspirated appropriately at times uh, if there is a complete obstruction there could be out of secretions probably rapid sequence induction and intubation is one of the options that needs to be looked for also uh, uh, after induction uh, the ng tube may be placed uh, wherever it is possible depending upon partial or complete obstruction so that we can decompress the gi system coming to the airway management i know uh, this stack and manage it but just to summarize it for you uh, uh, the most common uh, utilized modalities are uh, these patients require one lung ventilations and the most common modality for one lung ventilation is the double lumen tube But at times, uh, when there is lot of lymph nodes and the uh, airway anatomy is deviated, or there is some because of the presence of node, there could be some bronchial uh, uh, constriction because of the presence of lymph nodes. Sometimes the DLT placement may not be acceptable, may not be appropriate, or may not be feasible. And the presence of endobronchial blockers, especially like uh, ANT blocker or EZ blocker, is one of the options that can be used in these patients usually left sided dlt is uh, important is used and uh, it provides a, a good uh, option for providing one lung ventilation for these patients with many of its advantages so i think um, uh, today we class was about ca esophagus may not be going into the advantage of dlt but yes it provides a good control provide good uh, uh, deflation of the affected lung the suction can be done easily and it has various advantages but sometimes as i mentioned at times we need to use bronchial blockers it has its own limitation we can do suctioning the the uh, conversion is little difficult take some more time 
But yes, in selected patient, it could be one of the options. So coming to the last few slides, uh, nicely managed case by Patista. So uh, still there could be some complications which are unavoidable. So what post-operative complications you look for? Uh, so the most uh, the one uh, some pulmonary complications as uh, as previously mentioned the, these patients are prone to post-op pulmonary complications. Second, uh, uh, this can be cardiac complication as atrial fibrillation we had discussed previously. But one of the most common uh, complication is the anastomotic leak. If the patient in the post-operative period de suddenly develops uh, dyspnea, tachycardia, flushing of face and breathlessness develops uh, with the dip of oxygen saturation. These are most commonly during the first five days and associated with severe sepsis. Then we should uh, suspect anastomotic leak. And uh, if there's a major leak, we uh, the surgeons usually proceed with the re-exploration. But if it's a small leak uh, with uh, good uh, uh, with a good patient status, uh, we can it can be managed conservatively with conservatively with keeping patient NPO with IV fluids, NG NG tube drainage, antibiotics, and or USG and CT guided drainage can also be done with extensive physiotherapy and high protein enteral feed or TPN can be given in these patients. And you and rightly it, mentioned that these patients can have cardiovascular complications, pulmonary complications. Uh, which we have discussed earlier also. So we may not be repeating the same, but yes, uh, just to mention that uh, AF is one of the commonest complications. Uh, Operating amyloid has not much role, but in case if it happens, you can start them on amyloid incidence. The, uh, especially with the age related factors, because in the initial, we talk about if it is an 80 year old male patient, but other issues are, we mentioned that uh, yes, uh, age is not an issue for uh, the outcomes. But it has been seen that the delirium is uh, one of the independent predictor of the uh, occurrence of various morbidity and mortality in the post-operative period. And it is, is, it is age related. Uh, it is seen more commonly in the cancer patient and hence we should be a little careful. So last question, uh, Patista, before we say you are passed for this case is, uh, how would you provide the analgesia for these patients, intra-op analgesia and the post-op analgesia? Uh, the, uh, we'll follow the multimodal analgesia in these patients. Uh, from the uh, starting of the surgery, we'll, uh, I'd like to go proceed with the uh, GA with ep uh, thoracic epidural in these patients. And intraoperatively, I would like to give uh, local anesthetic like rupivacaine infusion from the start beginning of the uh, uh, beginning of the uh, operation and will continue in the post-operative period also. Along with that, uh, I would like to add uh, paracetamol uh, in these patients. And diclofenic, if uh, the the patient profile is uh, renal, if the patient profile allows, like like it is not, uh, if the patient is already having renal toxic uh, chemotherapeutic drugs or the patient has deranged RFTs, I will avoid that. Along with that, uh, other some of the uh, drugs that have been uh, can be used is like uh, uh, local anesthetic uh, infusions, like lignocaine infusions, magnesium sulfate are also indicated, if required. And uh, in the post-operative period, uh, rupivacaine infusion, uh, I will like to continue along with the paracetamol and with diclofenic SOS required. So you rightly mentioned that multimodal uh, analgesic strategy is applicable for these patients. Do you have any concerns about uh, use of opioids and cancer in these patients? Uh, so opioids, uh, are, some of the studies have shown the, uh, the immunosuppression effect of the opioids. So uh, that has been associated with the recurrence in cancer patients. So plus along with that, uh, they also have a, uh, uh, the respiratory suppression effect that uh, I will like to avoid in these patients because the, we want the patient to do extensive incentive spirometry. And uh, good, uh, good. Uh, we don't want the patient to be sedated uh, and we want the patient to be active. Uh, so we want, uh, we like, and Overall, the patient, uh, the local anesthetic infusion have been found to be superior as compared to the opioids. So I'll always prefer local anesthetic infusion as compared to the opioids. Right. I think this is an important point. We should be looking for the multimodal management. The uh, opiate sparing uh, techniques can be used and the local anesthetic techniques uh, using the infusion through the central neurexial blockade, especially the apparel block or maybe uh, the other, uh, other uh, drug in addition to it should be used. A little cautious about the NSAIDs for these patients if they have uh, pre existing uh, uh, renal disease because these patients may be long standing diabetes or they may be having some toxicity because of the chemotherapy. So be cautious about using the NSAIDs in these patients. 
and uh, I, I just just put up a light last slide because uh, um, not all the patients will be surgically operated. This patient, for example, may be a little unlucky one, a 75 year old male uh, who comes to you with progressive dysphagia and weight loss for five months. And uh, he has an, uh, a diagnosis of uh, CA esophagus of middle third, and it is stage 4B. So how should we go further on? All patients, as I mentioned in the beginning, that they may not be operable. So as anesthesiologist, we should also be concerned with these patients who otherwise are not curable. Probably these patients may be posted for symptom management, that is pain control, allowing them to have a nutritional intake and making or improving their quality of life better. They can have a palliative chemo radiotherapy to decrease the symptomatology, and they will be on best supportive care, which means that all comfort care need to be provided to these patients with good amount of symptom relief, including the pain, which remains very, very important. And when we talk about, uh, uh, we have discussed the majority aspects, but just to touch the last couple of slides, there is something called enhanced recovery after surgery. We have talked about uh, the management of CA esophagus started from, starting from the assessment till the post-operative complications. But nowadays we want to have a rapid turnaround and the, that's why the RAS protocols are coming up early. Demolo the tubes as early as possible is important. We have to change our management strategies using a shorter acting drugs, which will prevent undue delay in their recovery in the post-operative period and early discharge is one of the option. And that's why uh, the various techniques of uh, uh, shorter acting volatile agents, intermediate acting neuromuscular blocking drugs, using various monitoring tools so that these patients have a recovery good. Giving a uh, goal-directed fluid therapy is important lung protective strategy so that they have a lesser amount of lung injuries and better recovery. Uh, that needs to be continued in the post-operative period also. They should not be having an overloading of fluid because that will delay the recovery and obviously affect the, uh, is the, affect the outcome of these patients also. We need to have proper lung uh, management strategies, including the lung protective strategies. And also we need to be looking for uh, recruiting the lung uh, after the provision of one lung ventilation so that these patients have a better lung recovery. And we only talked about the prehabilitation aspect. The extubation, these patients are usually extubated uh, on table majority of time in case if they're delayed because of some respiratory complications or air-related complication, they need to be uh, put on a mode which prevents any further chances of uh, lung injuries and hence needs to be extubated as, as possible. These patients may require ICU care, especially on the background of uh, systemic pathology. Otherwise, these patients uh, uh, on a clear-cut case without involvement or without having unoptimized uh, comorbidities, this can be easily managed uh, in the post-operative post recovery area itself. The early ambulation, the chest physiotherapy, removal of all pipe and drains as early as possible, giving them a multimodal analgesic management are again important aspect of the RAS protocol in the post-operative care. A good amount of post-operative pain control needs to be given to these patients. We have already discussed them. Multimodal strategy is, 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 is uh, one of the important aspects. We already mentioned that uh, the gabapentinoids, ketamine, lignocaine infusion, magnesium sulfate, they have some promising rules. They have been used in some of the case studies, but uh, other strategies need to be followed for these patients. Uh, the chest drain, the uh, drain from the surgical site needs to be removed as early as possible because uh, uh, these itself are the stimulus for delayed recovery. The chances of infections and hence may be removed as early as possible. The early enteral feeding uh, with target nutritional rate on uh, second on third day onwards is strongly suggested for these patients without any effect on the recovery of these patients from the surgical point of view and hence the uh, Early feeding is, is very, very desirable even for these procedures. As we mentioned earlier, these patients are prone for uh, thromboembolism and hence the antithrombotic prophylaxis starting from the preoperative period needs to be continued in the postoperative period with early ambulation, which is important. So to conclude, uh, esophageal cancer is uh, one of the commoner cancers and uh, it causes a lot of morbidity. A lot of uh, uh, nutritional related issues can happen in these patients. And hence, uh, we need to provide them a preoperative optimization with regards to the neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy, prehabilitation, 
and a proper planning of a perioperative care is important to give them an uneventful outcome. So thank you once again. So I will request our moderator and our teacher today, Dr. Jashri Sood, to comment and um, uh, maybe uh, write and comment. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Rakesh and Jaksha for that very, very uh, interesting uh, case discussion. And it was a very comprehensive uh, discussion in the sense that it covered everything right from the anatomy and right up to the post of complications. Uh, the only thing I just wanted to stress on the students was this word prehabilitation. Some of them are not aware of this term. So this term is very, very important. And it covers everything, including the nutrition as well. So that was very important. And of course, the other aspects as well. So truly speaking, Rakesh, I don't really have anything to add, <laughs> except that the students should go through this uh, webinar, this case discussion that we've had, because it has been so, uh, you know, covered extensively right from the physiology and the anatomy and right up to the post-op care. And Pratishta, you did a very good job. That was very good. Well presented. Thank you. So uh, that is, that's all that I can really add on. Thank you so much. And uh, Devlina, if there are some questions from uh, the chat, uh, uh, we can take up. So, ma'am, we have one question from yes. uh, Dr. Muthu Kumar. Yeah. Alcohol influence with anesthetics, withdrawal post-operative. I think this is an important question. Uh, this is, uh, when we talk about the withdrawal symptoms, it is applicable for both smoking as well as alcohol, or maybe because of any drugs that patient is taking. And sometimes these patients may be on opiates as a part of pain management. So, the withdrawal symptoms can happen in these patients. And uh, these are usually manageable. Now we have safer drugs which are available. For example, say patient, those patients who are smoker, and if we ask them to stop smoking for 24 to 40 hours, probably there will be some amount of tachycardia, there will be some anxiety, they may not be able to sleep. Probably a shorter acting uh, angiolysis would be applicable for these patients. If they manifest some amount of COPD symptoms, some spas, probably we can start them on bronchodilators. Same thing can happen with alcohol withdrawal symptoms also. But now these are things, manageable things. These patients do require counseling. So we do not have an alcohol preloading for these patients as we do for carbohydrate loading because it gives more harm. And we have safer drugs which we can give to these patients. But yes, we should agree that uh, alcohol withdrawal, uh, 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 there could be issues. Smoking withdrawal, we you sometimes use nicotine patch also for these patients. Sometimes we use uh, benzodiazepines for these patients. So we have to be a little empathetic towards these patients uh, for management symptomatically rather than giving some specific management. So it is more of a symptomatic management. Another thing, Rakesh, I wanted to tell the students that uh, about the role of opioids and cancer recurrence, the interaction. So that is very important again. These are the new things that have come in the last couple of years and gaining a lot of importance. And uh, of course, these surgeries are done in tertiary care centers. So definitely the students who are, don't have this opportunity in their hospital, I think their uh, uh, guides should make it a point that they should attend these. Because once you see these cases, how they are prepared and how they are conducted, you will remember them well. Another new thing that uh, Dr. We, we discussed in this case discussion was the CPET. And that is, of course, a, again, a recent thing. And only very few institutions in India have it. Of course, AIMS is one of them. And so th that will also be com uh, coming up in a, a very important way in the future. So students must know these four aspects of uh, conducting uh, surgery or anesthesia for major, especially oncosurgery or for any major surgery in which we have this uh, massive catabolism and post-op extensive surgery. Am I right, Rakesh? These are the yes, two things that the students must know. These are the new things. And CPET, after a few years or months, they'll start getting as a short note in their examination. I <laughs> so think it is already coming as short note in some of the exams I've yes, seen. Yes, yes. So and workshops be. have also started on this. Yeah. Any so other Dr. question? People wanted some PPT. So I think this is all recorded and it will be loaded on our website. Uh, tomorrow morning so you can have the whole lecture uh, you can listen to that on our website tomorrow morning they will all be all our lectures and all our uh, discussions are all loaded on our website 
Anything else? Uh, no more question. I think uh, Dr. Radha Krishnan, uh, Dr. Shanish is there, Dr. Bimla Ma'am is there, yeah. Dr. Manor Ma'am is there. Any comments, anything we have missed or with your experience we can add on? So that it is beneficial to the other residents who are listening to us. Uh, Rakesh, I just want to say that, you know, very good lecture, very comprehensive. You uh, discussed the subject, you know, dealt with it in great detail. And you, uh, congratulations to your postgraduate. She has passed with distinction from my side. <laughs> oh, Hello, Rakesh. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, yeah, thank you. Rakesh. <laughs> Hello. I have some small doubts. Sir. I request either Rakesh or Josh uh, to clarify. Yes. Yeah. You were telling about uh, multimodal analysis in the perioperative -op phase. And you are awarding the narcotics. Do we think it is criminal to avoid the narcotics totally? You can have a small dose of narcotics because narcotics helps in many ways, especially in a cancer patient. Right? Because it induces narcosis. It induces some sort of calm feeling to the particular patient. Right? So don't you think avoidance of narcotic is not that great? Because you were telling everybody only about the epidural, as well as the paracetamol and other supplementary answers, and again the ladder pattern and all. Ladder pattern, I really doubt whether it's going to work here with the perioperative phase. So I think, Why don't you uh, consider? And I am serious about that. That's the reason I am asking. Why don't, think, uh, yeah. Why don't you consider about the narcotic in small doses, especially for the first two days? Yeah, I said, I, I fully agree with you. And I think this is a very important question. Uh, Sooth ma'am will uh, uh, correct me and add on subsequent uh, after I just clarify the things. Uh, you rightly said that uh, there were some concerns about uh, the use of opiate and cancer recurrence and side effects. And that's why uh, uh, terminology came up, uh, opiate-free anesthesia. And uh, then we realized that uh, opiates are not so bad. You rightly mentioned opiates are not so bad. As Sir, opiate-free of... anesthesia, that came evolved some 15 years back. Old. Because so, yes. when this particular abuse was going rapidly, yes. and it was yes. rather venomous in the US and all, well, somebody somewhere started this particular time, opiate-free, because they were rather looking on the benzodiazepines as well as strong antihistamines to That's replace. True. Yeah. But now I think uh, it is more of a uh, contribution from the Western countries, not from the Indian countries, because Indian countries, we are already using opiate very sparingly, sir, because it's not available around India. We are already using so sparingly. So I think India is the best country to uh, promulgate something called opiate sparing anesthesia. And you rightly mentioned small dose of opiates are not so bad. But simultaneously, I think uh, uh, the residents should also understand that it's not the opiate pain itself can cause cancer recurrence. Pain itself can cause the uh, delayed recovery. Pain itself can cause uh, uh, depression of the cuff leading to pneumonias. Pain itself can lead to a delayed ambulation. Pain itself can lead to increased amounts of venous thromboembolism. Pain itself can lead to increased amount of length of hospital stay. So it's not just opiate. So we have to take care of the pain management here. And that's why, as you rightly mentioned, sir, it is a multimodal management. We are giving some opiates to these patients at the induction of anesthesia. It's not absolutely opiate free. We use, in addition, some central neurexial blockade like thoracic epidural for these patients, which we start with the infusion of local anesthetic agents. And then we can supplement it with IV opiates as and when required. And you rightly mentioned that for initially two to three days, uh, a good pain management is the key for good recovery of these patients. And we should not be. Uh, no, running away from using opiates. Use opiates sparingly and cautiously. Do follow the opiate sparing strategies. Nowadays, uh, many of the youngsters are very well versed with uh, uh, ultrasound guided various nerve blocks, though they may not be so applicable for esophageal surgery, where the thoracic epidural is one of the modalities that remains up. But yes, we can add on the other modalities like the IV infusion of local anesthetic agents, the use of magnesium sulfate, use of ketamine, which is now emerging as one of the important parameters. But yes, uh, uh, local anesthetic, small dose of opiates, paracetamol, it remains one of the modalities. I fully agree with you, sir. I agree on all those things which you are telling. But only thing is, 
narcotics cannot be replaced by any of these particular drugs yeah. and but that's, that's what i that's what basically, i know <laughs> basically for the students to know what is yeah. the latest literature you know practically yeah. comes later but they are supposed to know the relationship of cancer recurrence and opioid so that we have to know and then as rakesh said small doses are of course always given and recommended but they should know that this entity although controversies will take place later on the studies are going on but yes this is the in thing that is being uh, this thing studied <laughs> again rakesh could you highlight on one particular matter and in no problem carcinoma is of agus with multiple metastases and the patient in pain patient is on palliative care otherwise patient is presenting for a bladder tumor and probably it needs a little bit of bladder shaving i mean for aggression of the tumor what sort of analysis will you consider at this particular stage patient is terminal cancer patient is in pain real agony but unfortunately this also has sprung up what sort of analysis here or in this sort of terrible situation where the cancer is in terminal stages but the patient is still with some other complication a palliative surgery has to be brought in and what sort of analysis here you may be able to take so i think this is an important question at times uh, we do uh, palliative surgeries for symptom management or sometimes patient has an incidental second primary in addition to the first primary and for symptom management we, like for example say stoma creation or as you mentioned trbt uh, or maybe sometimes they have a bleeding bladder uh, and that needs to be fulgurated or sometimes even the formalin injection so this has to be individualized because when we say a metastatic disease the uh, involvement of various organs are to a different extent so that's not very uniform that what type of presentation these patients have so depending upon the individual patient uh, we need to uh, uh, take a decision for the management so for example see this patient with cesophagus locally advanced with metastasis with the bladder second primary with bleeding tumor with four fulguration probably a regional block in the form of a csc or a spinal block will be appropriate for these patients sometimes these patients may have vertebral metastasis though it's not very common in these patients and those patients probably a uh, uh, ga would be required for these patients because uh, the urinary bladder is not amenable to these nerve blocks uh, i mean peripheral nerve blocks so probably ga would be required in these patients and these patients actually remains very challenging because they are malnourished their albumin levels are very low their respiratory function is not good so this is very challenging and we need to individualize these patients to a large extent but having said that i will end on a note that all patients do not require surgery many of the times now <clears throat> we are looking forward for other interventions like for example a patient of urinary bladder is bleeding so now we are going for more of a <clears throat> uteroscopic procedures or endoscopic procedures or radiological uh, embolization for these procedures and sometimes even drugs like for example say formalin injection into the bladder sometimes we use tranex tranexic acid for these patients so these are the other modalities that we need to look for many of the times it thinks that surgery is the only intervention but by doing other interventions other procedures which are less invasive we are able to provide them the same quality of life with less misery by providing uh, uh, care to these patients so we have to think a little more holistic we do not have much evidence it is upcoming but yes uh, working in a big center where we have all facilities of uh, uh, radio embolization and uh, other drugs we are able to manage these procedures for uh, such high risk interventions even as simple as uh, uh, a hemostatic radiation therapy is equally good for these patients and doesn't require any anesthesia as such thank you rakesh thank you for the answers Thank you so much. And I really appreciate your discussion. Thank you. In fact, so you have shown an excellent track of case discussion. Thank I you so thank much. you and your postcard student for the wonderful evening supplied to us. Over to you, Doctor Jayesh. Thank you so much, and just like thanks to Doctor Pradista Yadav. She was busy uh, on a holiday mood, so I asked him she should come back and come for the class. So thank you, Pradista, for joining us. Yes, yes, yes. That she definitely um, needs these compliments. Uh, so uh, we come to the end of today's webinar, the first case discussion series that have started, and uh, 
we are very happy that it went off very well. Heartiest congrats, Rakesh, as always. And we'll be meet, meeting next Wednesday again for our next program. Thank you very much, Dr. Radha Krishnan, Sainesh, Pratishta, Rakesh. Good night. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Good night, everybody. Good night. Right. Good night. 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 Good night.